Thank you very much, Mr. President. Can I just first say something about the uh, civil servants' dispute with the government? That's got that off. Um, <laughs> basically, can I just say that I want to tell you one or two odd facts and figures about aeroplanes which you possibly didn't appreciate, and B, to alleviate any fears the next time you fly. <laughs> Um, my track record is that I flew with the RAF for 12 years, always because I wanted to fly, but could never afford to do so. So I went to the Queen, who had more aeroplanes than everybody else. Um, she taught me to fly for 10 years, then I left and became an air traffic controller. But I am still a civil servant. The Queen pays my salary, therefore I'm a civil servant. But the oddity is that I work at Birmingham Airfield under a contract for rent -a mouth whereby um, <laughs> if you own an airfield, you're obliged to have air traffic controllers. The government lease the controllers to the airfield and the oddity is that Birmingham airfield is owned by the West Midland authorities. The rate pairs of the West Midland authorities own the airfield. I pay my rates to the West Midland authorities and therefore I own the airfield <laughs> and therefore I am a self-employed civil servant. <laughs> There aren't many of us around, <laughs> um, but those that are have got their pension stitched up a treat, I can assure you. Um, up till about five years ago, there was no charge for air traffic control. It was a free service in this country, and we used to lose about £42 million a year. We were quite proud of that, actually. Uh, British Steel could do that every week. Um, but we used to drag it out over a full year. And, the, the government, in their wisdom, decided that we, will, we should become self-sufficient, like the post office. <laughs> and if you don't charge for your service, to recoup 42 million would prove difficult. It's like saying to the army, you will become self-sufficient. I mean, short of the odd rape and pillage, there's no way um, that the army are going to bring that money back. Um, so we get our money in two ways, in fact. One is straightforward, and the other will come as a shock. Um, the easy way was to levy every passenger, which is what we now do. So when you buy an airline ticket now, it doesn't matter who you buy it from or where you're going to, between 1 and 2p of your ticket price comes to us. That didn't bring anything in, so we went for the second one, which was a winner, and that is that if you own an airfield, you must have a license to go with it. Now, this is a shock bit. I don't know if you know this. It works very similar to television. If you have a television, you should have a license to go with it. Um, it doesn't improve reception. It's just one of the things you're supposed to have. Um, and if you haven't got a license for your television, forget it. There's only about four vans in the Midlands with spinning roof racks. Um, <laughs> And the chances of being caught are extremely small, in fact. But if you own an airfield, they're difficult to hide. Um, you know, you, you can put billboards around them, that sort of thing. Um, but people notice the odd jet going in and out. Um, and consequently, the government know where 80% of the airfields are in this country. Um, and from that point of view, we could increase the license fee. Now, five years ago, the license at Birmingham Airfield was £35. <laughs> Just an ordinary black and white license. Just a straight line. This year, we've increased that to 35,000. Uh, we don't mess about with 10%. Uh, we work on the principle that you won't get away with it very often, so when you do, you hit them hard. Um, we've just published our figures for the first six months of this year, and we're exactly 21 million in the red. <laughs> so it's all been a complete and utter waste of time, actually. The only reason I mentioned all that nausea was the fact, obviously, that there are bankers in the room who well understand facts and figures far better than I do. And you may well learn from this one fact, if nothing else. And that is that we have changed our accountancy system to the system which is used by Pan Am, which is the, the American state airline, which is the only state airline in the world who have not made a loss in the last five years. Pan Am make a negative profit. <laughs> We've gone for this in a big way. <laughs> uh, 
And so far this year, we're exactly 21 million in a negative profit situation. <laughs> I think it's fair to say at this point that the airfields make their money by charging a landing fee for aircraft. Every time you land an aircraft, you pay a fee at an airfield. If you take Heathrow as an example, every time you land a jumbo jet at Heathrow, you pay about £1,200. Now, we're not like the harsh outside world of industry and commerce that you're connected to. We're a very easy-going system, and we only charge 50%. All your takeoffs are free. There are no restrictions on the number you can do. <laughs> and, and we just charge for the landings at the end. <laughs> now, what do you get for 42 million pounds? Not a lot, really. Um, basically, you get safety. My records only go back 16 years, mainly because there was the biggest air smash ever in the 70s. Um, but it works like shipping figures. You draw a line above the Titanic and work up, that sort of thing. Um, we have not had an air traffic control contributed crash in this country in the last 16 years. We still get crashes on takeoff and landing, but that's the pilot's problem. There's nothing to do with me. Um, you know, if he can't get it right for the first and last three minutes of the trip, well, it's a pretty poor show, as far as I'm concerned. Um, my job is extremely simple as an air traffic controller. All I have to do is to stop the airplanes banging into each other, and I've won. <laughs> if they do bang into each other, I've lost. And the only redeeming feature is that if it's a good bang, at the subsequent board of inquiry, I'm the only one there. <laughs> So, if you're a smooth talker, you could stay in this job until you were 65. There's no major problem. The, the chance of having, or the reason of having a traffic controller is a little bit hazy, really. The chance of two aeroplanes being at the same place, at the same height, at the same time, is so mathematically remote as to be not worth considering. All you do with air traffic control is to force them down very narrow corridors, thereby increasing the risk of collision. <laughs> and thereby justifying the job of a controller to keep them apart. Um, obviously, one only really earns your corn when you only have one aeroplane, because now you have to take it sufficiently close to a hill um, for one of you to stay there and keep looking after them. If you go back in history a very short period of time before we had air traffic control, if you wanted to fly from here to France, you'd get in the aircraft, point it at France, and go. You were, of course, likely to meet somebody going Paris, Birmingham, and the crash occurred about halfway between your takeoff point and your landing point. This was bad news for the passengers. Um, but it was good news for the rescue teams. They knew where to go, it's say, tramping around the ground pins. Um, and they could get in there and find you within a fortnight. There was no major problem. The companies didn't like it. Passenger booking figures fell off, that sort of thing. And they came to the government and said, can you devise a system whereby one or two get through? You know, not a lot, but if we could get a couple through, it would be a bonus. So they devised the system then, which we still use today, in fact. But I must stress that this only applies to the Western world and not the Soviet bloc. Soviet bloc airspace is slightly different. They've got a super system going. It only takes 10 seconds to describe it, and I'll do it for you in a minute. Um, in the West, we have joined all the major cities of the world and the major routes, that's across the pond from Europe to the States, with what are called airways. It's a corridor about 25 miles wide. It starts 5,000 feet off the deck and it goes up as far as you and I are concerned forever. There is a top, but don't worry about it. You're not going to get that high anyway. But basically, you cannot fly inside these corridors unless you have prior permission from a ground controller. Therefore, we know all the airplanes in the corridor. Therefore, we can keep them apart. In the Soviet system, they've got, as I say, a slightly different method of working. Let's assume you're flying Moscow-Leningrad. You're given three things, a height, a route, and a speed. If you deviate from any of those three, you're joined by two MiG-21s on each wing, <laughs> and you land at the nearest available airfield. The passengers will continue by coach, and the crew are never seen again. <laughs> Um, it's a very good system. They don't get repetitive faults. And we were going to try this in the West, in fact. Unfortunately, we haven't got enough fighters to put one on each wing. And with modern airliners like Concorde, you're going slightly faster than our fighters at the moment. Um, 
it is a fact, of course, on Concorde, at 1,500 miles an hour, you're doing 25 miles a minute, which is faster than a bullet from a gun. There's no gun in this country which fires ammunition at that speed, which is why we've never made a military Concorde, because if it opens fire, it shoots itself down. <laughs> So at the moment, we're restricted to using this heap as a civilian airline. <laughs> now, basically, the air traffic control setup in this country is split into two ways. You have people who look after you when you're flying along the airway. These are called centre men, and they work mainly, my apologies, under the new law, they are called centre persons, which is quite right, in fact. There are 1,400 controllers in the country, and four of them are women. <laughs> Well, three of them are women, and there's one... <laughs> um, but you're bound to get that in any organisation, obviously. Um, basically, about 800 of these people work at a pit just outside uh, Heathrow called West Drayton. They work underground for about three months, then they bring them on the surface, walk them around a bit, and then take them back down again. <laughs> and they've never seen an aeroplane in their lives. They just see little blips on a radar screen, and they talk to these things quite happily. I have worked there for a little period of time. I didn't leave because of any of these reasons, but it, it is quite um, an odd setup. If you were to go and see them working there, you would find controllers sat around very similar to an upturned dustbin, a flat top radar. And radar has got one inbuilt problem that we've never really cured, and that is that it works off a three pin plug on the wall. <laughs> um, if you can imagine the scene at West Drayton, there would be something like six controllers sat around the dustbin, each with a headset on, talking to about 30 aircraft each, so there's about 180 maggots on the screen. The rules are you can do what you like with them, but don't wrap them around mine, that's the idea. <laughs> um, and you look after your 30, I look after mine. And the problem, as I say, with this um, electrical problem that we have so far is very similar again to television. That is, if ever you get home tonight, which is debatable, I suppose, the way we're going, but if we do get home tonight, don't switch your television off on the set, pull the three-pin plug out of the wall, and you'll find that if you have a 22-inch screen, your picture will go down to about a three-inch square for a short period of time, and then it will disappear down the hole in the middle. Picture the scene at West Drayton. Six controllers sat around a flat top radar, all talking to their 30 aircraft, when the tea lady treads on the three pin plug in the wall. And they all now stand and stare intently into a picture which is about the size of a pint pot. Um, all 180 aircraft are still there, but much closer together now than they were before. Um, they start to shout and their voice goes up a couple of octaves and then it goes down the hole in the middle. There is a stunned silence which is measured in microseconds and then they push their headset back off one ear because you can't hear each other talk with a hat on and they would say, where were yours? And you'd say, I've got two going into Gatwick, three out of Luton, two upbound to Manchester, two downbound out of Birmingham. The bloke said, that's quaint, I've got one going into Gatwick, two coming out of Luton and you chat about this and read the weather for anywhere. Doesn't matter where it is, Leningrad, anything. Just keep reading the weather, because while you're talking, they can't get in and ask you what's gone wrong. <laughs> and you push the plug back in the wall and the picture will return. Obviously, if you don't talk to aeroplanes, they tend to clear off in any direction that they wish. <laughs> and you can normally find 29 of your aeroplanes, but not the last one. So you sit quite quietly talking to your 29 and you watch the screen and you see one little maggot setting off on his own. <laughs> and you say to the earthers, anybody work in that? And they go, nothing to do with me, mate. You got all on with this lot, you know. And it has to be yours. So you just turn it round and bring it back into the pack. And the other type of controllers there are bank controllers. I should bring that up at an evening like this. But they're sat very similar to the top table here. And you'd see each controller using a tube which would give him about 20 miles of airspace. The aeroplanes jump onto the left-hand side of your tube, rattle down it, and just before they fall off the end of your world, you wake the man up on your right, tell him what all 20 aircraft are, he looks at them down the leg, and that's how it goes. When I first went there, of course, they put me at that end, out the way, um, and the man right at that end is the outbound controller from Heathrow, who is a sadist, uh, been highly trained to be completely unusable, and his intention in life is to get the aeroplanes off the ground at the fastest possible rate. So he launches the first one straight ahead, next one left, next one right, straight ahead, left, right. He can keep that up all day, one a minute. The man next to him is the catcher. Um, 
who has got to try and put this lot back into some form of order because you've got the Paris flights going north and the Glasgow flights heading south at this time. He will work them, get them back in the right order and so on down the line. I'm sat right at that end and they would shout as I could see the stuff coming down the screen to me and on a normal morning on the rush out of Heathrow you'd get about 30 aircraft at once on the tube, something like 15 jumbo jets amongst them. Just before they came onto my world, the man would punch me in the ribs, I'd put down the Revali or, you know, the page three, and he would say, 30, and they'd all jump onto my screen. <laughs> he would identify them for me, and I would work them for 20 miles. Just before they fell off the end of my world, I looked round and there was nobody on my right. <laughs> um, so I had to phone the next controller, who was the French controller. Now this incident occurred in August 1972, going back a long time, but it may affect some people in this room, because if you're going on your holidays in August 72, this was the reason it took a long time to get there. <laughs> the day in question was a Friday, and the French have got a super habit, and that is that they go on strike, but they don't tell anybody that they're going on strike. Friday morning, I would pick up the phone and say, Good morning, Pierre. I don't know if that's what his name, but everybody called him that sort of thing. And I would say, 30 for you. And he would say, hee haw, hee haw, hee haw. <laughs> I accept them. And I would say, knock out, and throw them over to him, you see. And what he did with them, I didn't care, as long as he didn't turn them around and bring them back. <laughs> this particular morning, Friday, August, I picked the phone up. I said, good morning, Pierre, 30 for you. And he said, I spit on your aircraft and put the phone down. <laughs> Which I thought was a bit strong, actually. Uh, you know, I hadn't said anything to him, so I rang him again. I said, come on, mess about, just take them. He said, he's finished today, we are on strike. No aeroplanes, we are not working. Good day, sir, and put the phone down. I said, that's novel. <laughs> so I rang the other controller, which was the other name which was etched into the desk, which was the Belgian Air Traffic Control Service, and I rang him and I said, good morning, Pierre, because they're all pretty much of a muchness, obviously, over there. <laughs> And I said, I got 30 for you. And he said, I accept them. I said, knock out and throw them all over to him. Now, the lad must have had a brainstorm, actually, because the Belgian Air Traffic Control Service isn't that busy. They have about three gliders a year. Um, <laughs> and to suddenly get jumped by 30 jumbos seemed a good thing to me, actually. But he did a sterling job. And he, anybody going on their holidays to Spain in August 72, he took them all the way through northern Europe. <laughs> into Italy, refueling in Rome, down to the toe of Italy, and back along the Mediterranean to get to Spain. That was the only way you could get there without going through France. Saturday I didn't work, but apparently it was chaotic. Sunday I worked, I'd never seen anything like it in my life. Everything turned left at Dover, which isn't the best way to get to Spain, you can believe me. <laughs> and by Monday it was getting a bit thin, so I rang this bloke on Monday morning, I said, come on, mess about 30 for you. And he said, I accept them. I said, knock out, you're back at work. He said, affirmative. We came back to work Saturday. <laughs> it's been very quiet this weekend. <laughs> Absolutely true, in fact. They went on strike for 23 hours and didn't tell us when they came back. <laughs> so I left uh, and I went to an airfield. And I now work at an airfield where you're responsible for takeoff and landing, which is far more interesting in the centre because this is the only thing you're going to hear about. Basically, the idea is that, as I said, we do the takeoff and landing, so it becomes a pilot controller relationship. Now, so that we get this thing straight, the easiest way is to let you do it yourself. Let you fly a modern aircraft and you'll see how the thing fits together. From now on, ladies and gentlemen, you are all pilots, not captains. Don't get carried away, just pilots, the lowest form of life on a flight deck. I want to be the captain, not because I want to show off, but my life's in your hands. One of the perks with your job as a pilot, of course, is that you get a good seat at the front. Uh, one of the drags with the job is that you're closer to the crash than everybody else, um, which is a tip the next time you fly as a passenger, you should always sit at the back, because they never knowingly reverse into hills. Um, and uh, if you're going for ultra safety, you should find under which seat they have put the black box. Because if that's the only bit they expect to get back, you should be fastened to it, right? Um, you know, so it, it is worth knowing where these sort of things are, okay? Now, what you're going to do is to fly a jumbo jet from Birmingham to New York. I need poetic license for this because if you take a jumbo with full fuel tanks and a full passenger load from Birmingham to New York, you're going by road. Um, <laughs> The runway isn't long enough to get airborne. It's a bit bumpy through Wales, but it levels out once we've got it over the sea. Um, and the other problem at Birmingham is, 
if you do land a jumbo at Birmingham, we haven't got a set of steps which are big enough to reach the door. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think it's, it is only the second biggest city in the country and you have to make some allowances, obviously, but we have had three jumbo jets at Birmingham, obviously. We've had a Qantas jumbo, Australian airline, which came from London to advertise a new booking office which was opened in Birmingham. And we borrowed a set of steps from East Midlands Airfield, Castle Donington, to get the passengers off it. And the second one was a British Airways jumbo that came in to be called the County of Warwick for a naming ceremony. The third aircraft, in fact, the third jumbo that landed at Birmingham was an Aer Lingus jumbo, who thought he was at Manchester, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that they all look pretty much the same from 12,000 feet. And most of us reckon he did a bloody good job to get that far anyway. <laughs> But assuming we had those two parameters, obviously, then we could continue with the exercise. Now, I'd better just fill you in on just one or two facts and figures on airspace first, before we actually get out onto the aircraft and fly it yourselves. Um, there are two types of airspace. One is called controlled airspace, which is inside the corridor, and one is called uncontrolled airspace, which, would you believe, is outside the corridor. Kept very simple for pilots. Um, the knowledge of reading and writing, and especially joined up writing, is probably not expected from most of us. And we do, in fact, name these airways in a colour code system with a red, blues, greens, and yellows, which are drawn on the map in those colours. So that if you can't actually say where you want to go, you can always utter the colours in order so that the ground controllers know roughly where, which direction you're going to go. You know, want to go down the blue one, and then the red one, and then the green one. And, and that's very much how the system works. Now, the two types of airspace are important because if you fly outside controlled airspace in uncontrolled air, then you fly VFR, visual flight rules, and it means, pilots, that you look out of the window and make sure you don't ram somebody coming the other way. Now, an example of that type of flight, if you wanted me to fly you from here to Bristol tonight, the answer is negative, because it's dark. <laughs> I don't fly in the dark, birds don't fly in the dark, I see no point in pushing your luck. Um, but, um, tomorrow, provided it wasn't hissing down with rain, because uh, if you've noticed, birds don't fly in heavy rain either. Assuming it wasn't raining and it was a nice day, we would fly VFR from here to Bristol. And it's easy from Birmingham because you fly due west until you hit the M5 and then you turn left. Um, and that would take you straight to Bristol. If you miss the M5, you keep going until you hit the coast and then turn left. That's the Cook's tour, but you're still going to get there in the long run. We would fly low levels so that we could navigate by rivers, railway lines, canals, motorways and coastlines. And you can't fly in cloud. On the ground, they look nice, white and fluffy. Remember the rules? You must look out of the window and make sure you don't hit somebody else. If you fly into a cloud in the air, it's like flying under a Negro's armpit. It's extremely dark inside a cloud. Um, any part of his anatomy, really, but you can see what I'm getting at. Um, and there, of course, may be some other buffoon coming up the motorway to Junction 4 to turn right to get to Birmingham. So you avoid clouds like the plague. Obviously, these rules only apply to the little passenger carriers, not the big jets. If you were going, say, on a Trident from Heathrow to Paris Orly, you'd be a little bit upset if it went uh, down the M4, followed the sea link across the channel, then went down the motorway on the other side. You expect them to go higher and faster and climb through cloud. And therefore, they fly IFR, Instrument Flight Rules, which is inside these corridors. Example, the next time you can afford to fly on Concorde, bear this comforting thought in mind. You'll be at 60,000 feet, twice the height of Everest, doing around 1,500 miles an hour. And at 1,500 miles an hour in Concorde, you have the nose up. You appreciate that when she's on the ground, they crack the nose on Concorde so it hangs below the aircraft, so the pilots can see where they're going. <laughs> Otherwise, they tend to stick it into hangar doors and things like that. Um, you know, which can be quite expensive, obviously. But in the air, you have the nose up, because if you don't, it breaks off. Um, and it's extremely drafty in a convertible at 1,500 miles an hour. Um, when you have the nose in the uplock position, you have two heat shields which come over the windscreens at the front, which are made out of metal. It says made in France or made in England. It depends which one you've got. But the comforting thought is that the pilot cannot see where he's going. There are two little windows at the side, so you can see where you've been, <laughs> uh, but you can't actually see where you're going. So he relies on a ground controller to make sure he doesn't ram somebody coming the other way. 
Now, he should worry little, in fact, because the only thing you'll hit at 60,000 feet is the other Concorde coming the other way, <laughs> or the odd Apollo rocket going up or coming down. And there's not a lot of traffic at 60,000, so you should worry little. Now, on your jumbo, you will fly IFR conditions, so you don't have to worry about the safety of the aircraft. Now, I know you've all flown with companies before, but I think just before we actually get out onto the aircraft and fly it ourselves, I'll just very basically run through how to fly the jumbo, because I hate one of you to tell me you didn't know how to do this when we got on the end of the drag. Now, I appreciate there are ladies in the room who are obviously pilots from another company, and I'm sure they'll understand the terminology that I'm using, which means there's no need to laugh in the wrong positions, actually. <laughs> uh, basically, there is only one, there's only one known method of flying, and that is the quadrant method. We do not use joysticks for flying, what you do with your joystick is entirely up to you. Um, the only people who have joysticks are fighter pilots because there's no room in the cockpit on a fighter. I'm not very tall, I'm about six foot two, but if I was to eject, cheeky, but if you did eject um, from a lightning, which is still a second line fighter in this country, when I bang out, it trims my legs off just above the knees under the dashboard. It stings when you do it. Um, you know, it's not as painful as staying with it, but it can make your eyes water when you do it. Um, and if you see a pilot about three foot six high, it could well be an ex-lightning man. Um, the other problem with the lightning is, even with the seat fully down in its down position, wearing a full bone dome, when they shut the lid and weld it, because they don't want you to get out anyway, um, I have to tilt my head on one side so they can shut the lid. Now, the world takes on a whole new look if you look at it like that, and then run at it at 600 miles an hour. Uh, but you'll get used to that, don't worry about that. Because it's so restricted, they have a single stick between, between their legs. Quadrant flying, to dive, you push the stick forward. To go right, you push that way. Left, you push that way. To climb, you pull it back till it hurts, okay? That's the quadrant <laughs> method of flying. Now, there's only one aeroplane which is different to that, and that is helicopters. Now, a helicopter has a single stick again. The rule is you can do what you like with it, but you mustn't hold it steady. You just move it. You keep it moving <laughs> all the time. You put on phenomenal amounts of power, and it defies all known law and lifts off. It should, of course, screw itself into the ground, obviously. <laughs> but they do lift off, and once you've got it into the air, you just go crazy with the thing until you get it to a sensible height, and then you hold the stick in one position and you watch what the helicopter does. Because if you want it to do that again, that is where you put the stick, right? Uh, you know, it is a little bit hit and miss on a chopper. Even the people that build them don't have a lot of faith. Um, they normally put uh, wheels, skis, and floats on them so that you've got a fighting chance when you come down, obviously. Now, on your jumbo, you don't have this problem. You've got a massive control column. There's two, in fact. I've got one in case yours comes off in your hands. But <laughs> it's a huge thing with an Allegro steering wheel on the top with the top and bottom cut off. So you've just got the horns at the side. But the rules are the same. Shove it, pull it, turn it left and right. Power assisted, easier than driving a tram. In the center of your column, co-pilot, is a small steering wheel about that round. It's called nose wheel steering. It does just that. It turns the two nose wheels below the ground and we drive it just like a car. Now, you can drive it like that in the air, if you wish. Um, it doesn't do a lot, just turns the wheels at the front. Um, but if you feel like having a go at it, by all means, do so. And the same applies to the brakes. These are far more effective on the ground um, than they are in the air. Um, if we come up fast behind a light aircraft, by all means, put the brakes on. Um, it won't slow us up, but it'll stop the wheels going round in the wings. Um, and it gives you that feeling of being part of a team, OK? Um, the only brake you should take any notice of is a handbrake. It's a ratchet-type brake between the two pilots. It's your responsibility, co-pilot. If it comes up here, it needs adjusting. It should come up about two notches. The rule is we mustn't land with the handbrake on. If you uh, land with the handbrake full on, the wheels don't go round, obviously, and you get this tremendous stench of burning rubber. Um, and it's followed by 18 bangs, and we're on the rim. <laughs> now, that means a lot of paperwork, obviously. Uh, you know, somebody's got to fill all this lot in when we finish. 
and it's the first thing that the accident investigation teams look for. They go into the crash and they see the handbrake full on. Now, I'm not the sort of skipper that would drop out. I mean, I'll stick with you all the way, but you're putting me in a bad spot. You know, I don't really know what to say to this fella. Um, I could say I didn't want anybody to steal the wreckage or something like that. <laughs> but it, it's, um, it's difficult to explain why we've landed with the brakes on. So, if you could knock the handbrake off before we land, we're going to get on like a house on fire. <laughs> now, you know how to fly it. We can go out to the aircraft and have a look at the aircraft. It's parked outside, it's a standard jumbo, it weighs 350 tonne when it's sat outside on the path. It's got 35,000, sorry, 32,000 gallon of fuel on board, which we stack in the wings. I'm not teaching you to suck eggs, but a normal tanker which delivers fuel to a garage carries about 5,000 gallon. So we've got between six and seven of those on our backs when we set off. We burn that juice at around 3,000 gallons an hour. So it's comforting to know that we've got about 11 hours flying on our back when we start. It's only a seven and a half hour trip to New York, so it's comforting to know that we've got nearly enough fuel to get halfway back. <laughs> um, the aircraft should have 18 wheels. If it hasn't, we'll have a word with the crew that brought it in. Uh, but normally there are 18 wheels. There should be eight under that wing, eight under this wing, and two under the front. Now, when you're sat in the aircraft, you're 32 feet above the ground. I only mention that in case you get out for walkies while we're on the ground. <laughs> it doesn't matter if the passengers fall out the back, but it looks bad if the crew fall out the front of this thing, and the passengers will lose all sense of confidence if they see people in big hats falling out the front of the aeroplane. We walk out to the aircraft. My first decision as the captain is to see if it's raining, because if it's raining, you are doing the outside checks on the aircraft, and I'm doing the inside checks. Uh, if it's a nice night, I'll walk around the outside, and you can sweat it out for 20 minutes before we set off. We get the passengers on board, we can carry up to 500 on the jumbos at the moment, um, which is just half the size of the biggest passenger carrier in the world, which is a Galaxy, a C5A American Transport, which has carried 1,100 passengers. There were Vietnamese, but it still counts. Uh, you know, I know they're only little, but you've still got to get them on somewhere. Um, so we've only got half the maximum number. For the rest of the talk, if you please hear, which won't go very much longer, this is the runway, the top table is the runway. My apologies, sir, but the wind is blowing from your end. <laughs> it is important because you have to take off into wind and you have to land into wind. Well, you don't have to, but your aircraft takes up the attitude of a breeze block if you don't. <laughs> and everybody else does it this way, so that's how we're going to do it. Um, so we start from that end of the runway, take off, and we land through that wall and come on. The aircraft, of course, is parked over here on a stand, which is where the, air the aircraft is parked and where the passengers will get on board. I'll make sure the passengers are on, I'll kick-start the engines, get them running for you, and you will taxi the aircraft from the stand and put it on the end of the runway. As we pull away from the stand, you, your little eyes, light up as you turn your little steering wheel, full power on. If the aircraft goes dong, 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 you have left the steps down at the back. <laughs> now, that is one of your checks. Um, you do brakes and steps, I'll do engines and her steps. That's the sort of system that we're working on. We have another run at it, you taxi out and you line up on the end of the runway. Now, I would appreciate it if you would put the nose wheels in the direction that we want to go. If you leave them off at 90 degrees and don't tell me, I'm bound to find out sooner or later. And it means that on takeoff, instead of going down the runway, we should go through the hangar and come back on. Now, you can tell the passengers anything over the intercom, they're so blind drunk at this stage, they wouldn't understand what you were talking about anyway but they're bound to notice if we go through a hangar on takeoff. So if you could line it up, I would appreciate it. Once we're lined up, I put on my white kid leather gloves with an L and an R on the back. Um, this is just sort of an aid memoir. Um, you know, I don't need this information, but I don't want to ask stupid questions if it goes wrong, that's all. And we're ready to roll. Now, when you buy a jumbo for 25 million pound, you get a handbook with it, same as when you buy a new Mini. And it says on page six that this aircraft will get airborne at 180 miles an hour. And the editor's decision is final on that. <laughs> so all we've got to do is 180 miles an hour down two mile of concrete and it'll go up because it says so in the book. Now, the ground controllers will give us clearance for takeoff, which means there's no horses or Midland Reds on the runway, that sort of thing. 
if you're at Tenerife, you ask him again. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I don't mind if you get out on the wing and have a look. You know, uh, when you're pretty convinced that we're the only jumbo on this runway, then we'll have a crack at this. And during the takeoff run, one of us ought to look out of the window. Otherwise, the aircraft tends to run off the edge and it breaks all the lamps down one side of the runway. <laughs> And of course, anybody landing in the dark behind us could use all the lights they can get their hands on. So I'll look out of the window, make sure we stay down the middle. Unfortunately, I can't read the speed whilst looking through the glass. So you will call the speeds to me as we increase. When we get to 170 miles an hour, you scream, rotate. I panic because I've never heard that before. <laughs> and then I remember on page five in this handbook, it says at 10 under takeoff, you scream, rotate. Now this is why I'm doing it and not you. At rotate speed, I very gently ease the stick back, very gently. The idea is to lift the nose wheel off the floor and balance 350 tonne on a main 16 wheels so that we get a bit of draft underneath, otherwise it's not going to go up. <coughs> For obvious reasons, when I'm carrying out this balancing act, we chain the passengers in. Um, you don't want people tearing up and down inside the aeroplane. <laughs> so we used to normally we'd chain the passengers in for takeoff and for landing. They expect it now, so that's what we will do. If I overcook it, pull the sticks too hard, the tail will hit the floor, <laughs> thus ripping the toilets out the back. <laughs> now, with 500 people on board for seven and a half hours, we could be knee-deep by the time we get there. <laughs> which is why, if you look on a modern airliner, you'll see at the back what is called a skid. It's a bar which hangs below the aircraft with a hydraulic ram against it, and that will touch the ground before the tail. In the cockpit, there are lots of red warning lights which flash and a klaxon which sounds to indicate that we have overcooked. And we will switch those off. <laughs> um, there's nothing more disconcerting when you're panicking to have red lights and a klaxon going, obviously. Um, so if I do overcook it, we use a manual system whereby if I do overcook, you can hear the tearing metal noise. It's very distinct. You couldn't miss it. Um, and it's followed instantly by the steward banging his handbag on the door behind us. <laughs> Um, and at that point, we level the aircraft and hold her in a balanced configuration. At 180 miles an hour, you scream 180, I haul the stick back hard, and she climbs off at about 2,000 feet a minute. If it doesn't go up, well, you've picked a loser with this one. Um, can't take a joke, shouldn't have joined, that sort of thing. Um, but the correct terminology, if it doesn't lift, is that we are bought on the runway. And any other bodily function that takes you at the same time, really. Uh, because it's a bit embarrassing when it all goes wrong at 180. But the idea with an abort is power off, brakes on, we come to rest on the runway, tap the gauge, get it working, go back and have another go at it. If we abort with a serious fault, say with an engine fire, I've had a word with the fire service, and they're having grave difficulties in getting ladders and hose pipes up to 12,000 feet. <laughs> so we've come to a compromise that if we keep the fire on the ground, they'll come and put it out, right? Um, so this is the drill if we are bought with an engine fire. Now I must stress, pilots, that this is for your ears only and must not under any circumstances be divulged to a passenger. If we are bought with an engine fire, we come to rest on the runway and we evacuate the aircraft. You have 90 seconds to get 500 people off. Good game, good game. <laughs> you go down the back, open all the doors, and you shout, get off! <laughs> and they all look out 32 feet onto the concrete and sit down. Obviously, it's safer to stay on it. So now we inflate chutes out of the side, like a huge child slide with a canopy over the top, and you ask people politely to step into the end of it, which they do, whistle down 32 feet onto the concrete, an ambulance has moved them back from around the skirt of the aircraft, and that way we can get everybody off. The crew will be the last to leave the aircraft. I, as the captain, will be the last of the crew to leave. If I pass you on the way out, you are to assume the rank of captain. Is that right? <laughs> I just thought we'd clear that up, that's all. Um, you know, we don't want any questions asked at this stage. Now, normally they go up because says so in the book, and once you're in the air, you can sit on your butt for seven and a half hours and let it fly itself across the Atlantic. It uses an inertial navigation system, exactly the same as the moonshot. The satellite uh, tracking system is exactly the same, programmed to a distant destination. But they 
the system is exactly the same. So we can go down the back and have a drink. There's an upstairs cocktail bar in the jumbo. If you see me in the bar, walk away. Passengers don't like to see all the pilots drinking together, obviously. Um, so if I'm in the bar, you go down the back and talk to the passengers. When I'm loaded, you can come up, have a skinful, and then, and then I'll go down, down the back and have a talk to the, to the passengers. There's no problem. You've got seven and a half hours to sober up, so there's no real sweat on at all. These are company rules, not mine, OK? I must stress, we must not be seen together in the bar or in the toilets, OK? These are just, uh, <laughs> as I say, these are company rules, and you should know them if you're joining the company. All we have to do now is land this heap, and we can quit. Takeoff is brute force over ignorance. It has to go up. But landing bites if you get it wrong. You remember, you have to land right at that end. If you land right at the end of the table, your wheels will rip the tops off the Midland Red buses on the Coventry Road which is not approved. If you land past here, you'll land okay, but by the time your brakes have activated, you're on the golf course at that end. That is a municipal golf course. You're not allowed on unless you've booked. <laughs> I must stress that I don't play golf, in fact, at all. I'm just, the only time I've ever hit two balls straight together was when I trod on a garden rake. <laughs> the... The only place you can land, I wish I never said that now, I think. <laughs> Where were we? Yes, trying to land. We're trying to land. You must land here, which is the hit point, touchdown point, crash point, call it whatever you will. Two definitions at this stage. All landings are controlled crashes. And the definition of a good pilot is a man with the same number of takeoffs as landings. So, <laughs> now, to assist you to hit that point, they have installed what are called vases. More about that in a second. All you need to know to land is three degrees. It's not a pop group. It's the angle you're supposed to come in at. And at three degrees, you drop 300 foot per mile. Highly mathematical, this. So if you're five miles out, it should be at 1,500 feet. Four miles, 1,200, you got it all the way home. Now, there are some people who don't like landing at three degrees. These are people, for instance, that land on an aircraft carrier. Now, I think it's fair to say that anybody that lands on an aircraft carrier is mentally unstable. <laughs> you know, if they had any sense, they would land at the nearest available airfield and let the boat come in. That would seem logical. <laughs> but they insist on going ahead with this. So you come up high and fast behind the carrier, stick the nose down as if to impale your aircraft on the rear of its deck. Never at the front, because if you miss, it'll run over you. <laughs> so you do it at the back, and just before the nose sticks in, you haul the stick back hard, the nose comes up, the tail goes down, and smashes into the carrier deck, which is fortunate, because they've welded a crochet hook to your aircraft, and that wraps around piano wire, which is stretched across the deck, and you come to rest from 150 miles an hour to a dead stop in one second. Normally, with your face, press nothing in for that. <laughs> you get out on the wing, turn your bone down around the right way, and they all clap, because most of them have gone down the funnels off the side, haven't they? <laughs> now, if you do that with passengers on board, <laughs> they will all get off about two foot six high with baggy trousers. <laughs> because you cannot take that rate of descent. There are parts of your body which are not designed to pull 8G. And the people that suffer from that complaint will bear me out. So you mustn't come in high and slam it. Likewise, you mustn't come in low, clip a couple of sheep over the next head, because it's messy and people finish up in the racks. So you come in at three degrees. And to help you do that, now you have to listen to this bit, or you should get it all wrong, they have installed VASI's, V-A-S-I, Visual Approach Slope Indicator, VASI. It's an Ovaltine tin with a plate welded into it at three degrees. It has a light which shines over the plate white, below the plate red. They put one set on either side of the runway, early of touchdown, so you want to go over the top of those, so you should see white lights. And they put one set late of touchdown on either side of the runway, and you want to crash before you reach them, so you should see red lights on the second bank. So when you fly in, you should see white, red. If you see white, white, you're too high, which isn't dangerous. You're going over the top. 
but the passengers won't get off. <laughs> if you see red, red, you're too low, you're landing far too early, and you must climb quickly if you're with me. There's only one condition which is worse than that, and that is if you see green, because now the light is filtering through the grass and you are extremely low. <laughs> no, sorry, sorry, no, 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 no. No, no, it doesn't. I got carried away then, sorry. It only goes red or white. And after a couple of crashes, you learn to slam it down between the vases. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, is how 99.9% .9 of all aeroplanes land, by visually looking at those lights. What happens when it's foggy? Can't see the lights. Now you use an instrument landing system to get you down. It has two needles in the cockpit. One points left or right when you come in, and you turn the aircraft left or right till it hangs straight. The other needle will point high or low to indicate you're high or low on the approach, and you push and pull until she stays horizontal, and the two needles cross in the middle, a bit like space invaders, really. I would fly the needles, you will call the heights to me as we plummet towards the ground. Now, we're in thick fog, doing about 160 miles an hour, the wipers are going well, but you can't see anything at all, and you will call the heights to me calmly and clearly as we dive down towards the ground and I keep the needles crossed. When we approach 30 feet, you calmly and clearly call 30 feet! <laughs> we look up. And there, in front of us, are the lights. If you can't see the lights at 30 feet, full power on, we climb straight ahead, go round and do it again, and we have just overshot. We go around the second time, if we don't see it the second time, forget it, we'll go to Manchester where there's no fog, and we have just diverted. It's as easy as that. There is only one other method to be brought down, and that is to be talked down by a controller like what I am. And I will talk you down by using a high-powered, short-range radar, by getting you onto the beam, and directing you to turn <laughs> left or right. Now, obviously, I only stutter when I'm under stress, but you can. <laughs> You can talk an aircraft down by going left and right. You now know more about it than I do. And I'll leave you with one very last thing on Concord. It's going to take a minute. The next time you cross on a 707 or a DC-8, halfway across the Atlantic at 40,000, put one arm out the window. And two things will happen. A, everybody will go with you. <laughs> but B, the temperature outside, minus 40 centigrade. Next time you cross on Concord at 60,000, halfway across, put your arm out the window again. Rule A still applies, but they'll go twice as fast this time. <laughs> but B, the temperature outside, minus 100 centigrade. If you could now turn your hand and touch the outside skin of the aircraft, you would find that the skin temperature is plus 100 centigrade due to friction. Now, you can't have a piece of metal at plus 100 in an outside air of minus 100 without something happening. And on a straight and level flight on a transatlantic voyage, Concorde grows in length one foot. The whole aircraft expands by one foot. If you could take the carpet up in the aisle, it's a very narrow aisle in Concorde, you would see that the floor is in plates and you can actually see them move. If you can see daylight, you should tell somebody. <laughs> but they do move, and hopefully when we get to the other end, it will shrink. Because if it doesn't, we're going to have the longest Concorde in the world after three years. <laughs> And there are just two instruments on Concorde you should know about. One is inside the passenger compartments in the top left-hand corner, and it clicks up to Mach 2, twice the speed of sound, and everybody goes, very good, very good indeed. Because that's what they've paid £987 for. In fact, it's just wound on by a stewardess. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? It does go up to Mach 8, actually, but they don't want to show off at the moment. And the other one is inside the passenger, in, sorry, in the cockpit, and it measures the skin temperature outside. Because if that gets above 125 centigrade, you have got trouble with a capital T. Everything goes wrong, the putty melts in the windows, all sorts of problems. <laughs> and you must cool it. Now, you can't lean out the window and waft it with your cap. <laughs> the only way you can cool it down is to reduce speed. And if you see the pilots, you'd see them open up the tanks to 1500. As soon as the temps go to 120, power back to 1400 while the whole skin cools down. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. You now know a lot more about it than I do. Can I leave you with one very last thing which I never understood about aeroplanes? And that is, why they put frosted glass in the toilet? <laughs> <laughs> Who the hell's going to look in at 60,000 feet? I don't know.